Okay, welcome back everybody. For our next panel on fiber deployment, I have the pleasure of welcoming Onyene from MTN Nigeria, Jetlov from Vumatel, and Scott from Liquid Telecom Satellite. And this panel will be moderated by Adi Micah from DW. Adi, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Shana, for that uh, brief introduction. And I am definitely looking forward to hear what uh, the beautiful panel I have here have to share with all of us. This panel is all about uh, fiber deployment, talking about a new opportunity for internet service providers, ISPs, and content providers. That's the question we are going to be hoping to dig into in uh, the next uh, 45 minutes or so. You heard right. I am Eddie Micah Jr. I'm a journalist with uh, Deutsche Welle here in Germany. That's uh, Germany's international broadcaster. Now, it's a discussion because, of course, it's not just me. Let me introduce the panel here. Um, when I mention the name and brief introduction, it will be nice to get a wave from you. So get your hands ready, starting with Dietlov Mare, who's the CEO of Vumatel South Africa. Can we see you? OK, that's the wave. Thank you very much. And then uh, we have also Scott Mumford, who's the CEO of Liquid Telecom Satellite. Scott, OK. And then uh, my sister from another mother from Nigeria, Onyinye Ikena Emeka, General Manager, Fixed Broadband, MTN Nigeria. Give us a wave. Okay, great. Uh, I mean, it's only natural to do it. I'm from Ghana, so I'm particularly happy to have a Nigerian as part of this panel. Uh, don't worry, Onyinye, I'm not going to get into football. Just putting it out there that uh, it's good to have you on. <laughs> so let's get to the crunch of the topic, uh, discussing... Uh, fiber deployment, a new opportunity for ISPs and content providers. I think it's only natural and it's only right that we get to find out the state of fiber deployment in uh, the countries you guys are operating in. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Didlof Mare. I'm going to take two minutes from all of you to give us a, a broad state and then uh, we can continue. Didlof Mare, your turn. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, thanks for the opportunity as well. Yeah, I think, I think listen, it's, it's super exciting for us, you know, so, so we we're the biggest fiber provider in South Africa. And, and if I look at the markets and I, I even look at Africa, I think, I think connectivity is critical. You know, I think if we want to compete as a continent with the rest of the world, we have to get the connectivity right. You know? And if you look at, if you look at what's, that, what's happening on speeds and throughputs and volumes, uncapped services, unshaped services from the ISP, it's just driving data consumption, you know, and, and I think if, if, we, if we can get the connectivity going and we can get the penetrations right, I think we as a, as a continent can compete. And I think it's super, super necessary for us to get this right as telco players uh, in Africa to make sure we, we firstly close the digital divide, okay, and secondly compete with the rest of the world. And I think, I think we've got these challenges because we're low penetrated at this point. And I think the opportunities are there. And I think if, you, if we can connect the people, the businesses can flow from there, the ISPs can do other things, the, over the top players come in. And we've got so much capacity coming in from the sea cables at this point. It's, it's what do we do with it? How do we utilize it? And I think those are the questions that we, that we play with. But, but I'm super excited about the opportunities that Africa has in connecting people. And I think it's super critical for development. Okay, thank you very much, Titlov. Onyinye, MTN Nigeria. Okay, so just um, following on from um, Dietlov's um, opening, yes, uh, connectivity is quite critical, especially to our continent, um, as we work to um, grow our different economies, um, you know, especially from a small business perspective, which is a great driver of our economies from an African continent perspective. So speaking specifically to Nigeria, um, we do have um, quite a bit of um, fiber presence. A lot more can be done. I, I think we just have, um, you know, just under 90,000 kilometers of fiber nationwide, um, of which MTN Nigeria uh, provides the, the, the most expansive coverage at about 35,000 kilometers. Um, so a lot of work has gone in into trying to ensure that we um, extensively cover uh, the, the country. The government has um, a national broadband plan, um, which is also focused on uh, uh, ensuring 
full broadband coverage um, for the population. The whole objective of the plan is to ensure that, you know, by 2025, we do have about 90% of the population covered with 70% penetration across um, the different urban and rural areas. So um, we do recognize as a, as a country and as a telco, um, the importance of connectivity, especially reliable and dependable connectivity. Um, so it's a journey that we continue to uh, embark on from a private and public um, sector perspective to ensure that we are able to achieve on both the government's um, objectives and our objectives as a business. Luckily, this is quite tied into um, our objective um, and our ambition at MTN, um, which is to drive for leading connectivity operations. So we, we find ourselves totally aligned with um, the federal government, as well as the state governments to ensure that we put in place the right um, policies and we have the right um, environment to allow for continued uh, infrastructure rollout. Okay, thank you very much, Onyinye. Scott, uh, what can you share with us? I think really just to to echo um, echo the the, the Atlas and I don't mean to, I mean terrestrial connectivity or, or fiber connectivity into Africa is is hugely um, underserved at the moment. Um, we we all have a massive task on our hands, but you know internet penetration rates and and connectivity is a critical driver of of economic growth across the the, the world, um, and, and Africa's potential is is enormous. Um, you know, we've been been putting fiber optics in the ground for uh, some 15 years in, in liquid now and, and have a, a, a backbone network running from South Africa right the way up through central southern Africa and, and into East Africa. And, and we're continuing to invest in that because, you know, the, 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 the digital divide to use that uh, that that term is is so enormous. Um, you know, and the, the economic potential growth of, of Africa is is fast, but it, it's so dependent on being able to access the rest of the world um, and the rest of the world being able to get into Africa that, that you know, we have to keep keep developing and deploying and, and putting more connectivity into to the countries to enable that to happen. Mm. Uh, thanks, guys. I mean, I think one thing that runs through all that you guys have said is, is, is this word that keeps popping up, like uh, bridging the digital divide. And uh, we obviously all see the potential on the continent and this is what you know we aim to do or most of uh, you guys aim to do uh, so it's clear what the aim is what however would we say is the main challenge because it's already been quite challenging rolling out other types of uh, uh, internet services um, and now we are really digging into uh, fiber deployments so, only looking at nigeria being the most populous country on the continent what is the main challenge? Um, well, I think it's a it's a, a bundle of challenges, not you know um, not just um, one. And I think the very first one is the fact that fiber is a very capital intensive um, investment to make. Um, so any organization uh, who wants to focus on rolling out fiber has to be very financially um, buoyant. So it's not it's 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 not a journey that you can start. Uh, with a view to you know achieving on your objectives within a very short time, so it has to be staged. Um, that is one of the problems. Now, when you look um, specifically at the Nigerian environment, we do have quite a number of um, challenges that are also being faced. One of which is the right of way achievement. Um, each of the state governments handles their right of way, um, you know, trans uh, transactions. Yes. Um, separately. So this sort of creates a problem because you have different levels of, of um, pricing that is being thrown across to the telcos. Now, this is part of what um, the National Broadband Plan is also looking to fix to ensure that there's some sort of standardization um, across the different um, states and um, local governments in terms of um, the right of way costing. This would enable um, the telcos to plan effectively and be able to, you know, understand exactly the business plans that are required to achieve the rollouts that they desire. Another thing um, that also presents a problem is, you know, the individualized uh, routes to market or um, business plans or go to markets that each of the telcos have. 
Now, for um, an environment as um, populous as Nigeria, you would want a situation where there's some level of infrastructure sharing that would allow for, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, purposeful rollout. What you have today is a situation where all the operators are focused on the urban areas, and those urban areas are over fiberized. However, you have other areas that require fiber. Um, you know, when Jet Love was speaking, he talked about focusing also on the underserved areas. Now that is where the challenge is. So when I talk about this um, 80,000 excess, um, in excess of 80,000 capacity that are currently exists, most of it is situated in the urban areas, the Lagos, the Port Harcourt, the Abujas, but you have other areas within the country. And we don't find telcos moving towards these areas because based on expectation, they do not see um, the, the, the viability of other areas outside of these urban areas. So one of the things that could help this is a more structured um, and consolidated you know, approach to the way infrastructure is rolled out to ensure that we don't have any particular area over fiberized and other areas under, underserved. Um, so, so those are some of the challenges um, that we face. And of course, that we have the, um, the, the need to focus on areas that you believe are more um, are safer, and areas that you would actually, like I said, provide that would provide for the most profitability for you as a business. So once we are able to balance those out, which is you know the, one of the expected outcomes um, from from the broadband plan, we should be able to um, have an environment that allows for unified and um, continuous rollout across the different parts of the country, be it urban or rural just ensuring that at the end of the day, we're able to make it um, prof profitable for the telcos and then meaningful for the, the customers. Okay. And I mean, uh, did love for Mary, that is the challenge, isn't it? Uh, the fact that you're dealing with so many, so to speak, stakeholders, you're dealing with the government, you're also dealing with different uh, telcos because to some extent, there's also a competition more or less, right? Um, how do you go around all of this to have that focus and, and, and sort of be on the same page with all these stakeholders to still drive out this fiber deployment. And you're on mute, sorry, Deirdre. I agree 100% with, with what was said. Um, so I think, yes, the challenges are definitely penetration. You know, I think you look at South Africa, if you could look at homes penetrated, oh, we 20, 20%, 22% penetrated. You know, so we got we got just under four million homes covered. We've got seventeen million homes, different homes, different household incomes within those homes. I think, I think, but but it's a challenge because because that's the difficult thing. But it's also the opportunity leg of it, and I agree hundred percent. I mean, our scarce resource. I mean, like mobile and mobile operators have spectrum and frequency as a, as a scarce resource. Our resource is funding. It's it's how do you deploy funding in a structured way that you can. Get a capital, a return on capital, and I think that's that's the challenge. And and naturally, you'll go to the leafy suburbs and to the to the big metros where people are are, are are totally economically active, and and I think that's what's happening. So so all the competitors jump into this when they see it's working, you know. So so um, the challenge for us is how do you go to the outskirts? How to how do you extend those metros and how do you get into that that underserved areas? And the only way you can do that is to to have solutions and tweak technology that you can get the capital capital and cost of capital uh, deployed down. You know, and 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 we've we've worked on a few things, different techniques, different technologies. We started off with over a thousand dollar per home cost to build a home, and and through the changing it and tweaking a little bit, we. We basically on three hundred three hundred dollars an hour home, you know. So, so I think that's the that's the challenge. And then the, it's the propositions on top of it. What's affordable? You know, what can what can the people afford? And what do you have to give for that affordability? Out of that affordability point, and and what we've seen is if if you look at data, people want uncapped, no issue data. So no no limits. It's just uncapped at different speeds. And what we've even seen is if you go into these, these, these previously underserved areas, people actually expect minimum 30 meg services, you know. So, so because you've got seven, eight devices still in that in that house active. You know, so the challenge is how do you balance traffic, 
your back all, your access uh, cap, cap, capital spent versus the fiber to the home spent. And, and, it, and it becomes a financial model at the end of the day, but it's based on a scarce resource, which is funding. And, and I agree 100%. But, and, and I was actually on another forum last week where, where I explained, you know, what will happen is people will overbuild in these big metros, you know, the urban sides, and you'll have three, four, five players in there. People will start competing just on price. And suddenly, the mass gets left out. And, and I believe the success of connectivity is in, in basically getting, if you look at the services we're putting out there on top of this, it's getting the mass connected. But, mm. but I think that's it. It's how, do, how do we get solutions that make sense from a resource point of view, which is, is funding? And, mm. and honestly, I think there's good models. I think technology is supporting us. There's every day coming new things out. And it's also being, uh, and, and we pull, back, pull it back again to execution understanding the markets, and then getting your shareholders to obviously understand that your, your payback in one area might be three years and other areas might be five or six years. You know? So, so it's, it's, it's alignment of all those things. Mm. Uh, but then it's trying to focus the guys on spending cleverly the scarce resource, making sure we cover the country and, and linking up the people. That's, that's, for me, chasing the penetration. Mm. And I think that's the key. You know, okay. Okay. You know, Okay, uh, that, that's that's good to hear. I mean, we, we're talking about so many different challenges and we obviously want to penetrate more and more the market. Um, the appetite for internet consumption has definitely grown, especially during the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, we saw we saw the numbers for ourselves. I mean, especially when you talk about uh, streaming services and all. But but let me, before we get into that part, let me hit on something that I'd love you hit on, uh, which is uh, the issue of affordability. Yet, Scott, uh, coming to you, we know how expensive it is to roll out, you know, uh, fiber. Uh, so how do we go around the issue of affordability when we know many generally on the continent are already complaining about the cost of Internet access? Well, I, I think the answer to that is you need to have an honest conversation uh, and understand that fiber is not the answer to everything. Um, it's it's a part of the solution um, and it will be required to most areas, but you know, fiber to the home is not an economic model that's gonna work unilaterally across Africa. Um, it, it just isn't. Um, what it can do is provide backhaul services into wireless access services and into other infrastructures that enable a sharing of that resource and, and diversification of that cost across multiple areas that brings the cost of access down but you know fiber to the home is not um an economic solution for the the masses of africa uh, it, it has a place there's clearly a market for it uh, in in nearly every country in africa but it's going to be a a small percentage of, of the populations in most countries um but it, it, it's about uh, the, the, the fiber distribution is really about how do you get, um, you know, either 5G towers or connectivity between the data centers and 5G towers or, or wireless infrastructure to enable handset connectivity or device connectivity to the Internet and, and bring in those price points down so that the mass population have, have good high speed access to, to Internet services, um, you know, for a, for a fraction of the price. Um, mm. But, it, it, you know, to, to, to be clear on the size of the challenge here, you know, Internet penetration in Africa today is 34 percent. So there's 800 million people across sub-Saharan Africa with no connectivity at the moment. You know, so the, 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 the scale of the task we have to do to connect everybody is enormous. And, and that requires a, a broader spectrum of thinking around the, the, the way that that's done. Um, mm. Fiber is a critical part of that. You know, which is why, you know, companies like Fumatel in South Africa and, and MTN and, and Liquid are, are, are investing so much money in, in fiber infrastructure because, you know, it, it is an absolutely essential part of the, the, the critical infrastructure of getting connectivity there. But it, it's only a part of the solution. It, it's not the answer to the solution. Yeah, and I think that's a, a fair enough uh, statement that is being made. And I think uh, Onyinye, you would probably agree with that, that, for instance, uh, the issue of, say, 5G rollout, and even, honestly, on the continent, even still the rollout of 4G, and to some extent, the 3G, all this should be seen as an alternative to 
fiber to the house use and not a competition more or less is that what you would say Olivia? absolutely um i totally agree with scott um we're never going to have a situation where every single um, african has access to um you know fiber so that's not going to happen from an economic perspective it's just not tenable um so what we have to provide is a balance where we're able to effectively complement um the rollout of fiber, whether to the site or to the home, um, with other technologies that can also provide for the needed use cases. Bearing in mind that the technology is just an enabler. Um, at the end of the day, it's the use cases that the technology serves for our different market segments that actually is um, what drives the economic viability for us as a telco and for the end user. So um, ultimately, you're going to have a situation where you as a telco would need to balance out um, you know, and understand exactly what models would work for you from a financial and commercial perspective to ensure that you're able to effectively serve all your segments um, with the specific um, use cases that are important to them, uh, but at the same time, ensure that it, it, it does look good in your books. So yes, yeah. I agree with Scott. Fiber, fiber would never um, be the answer to everyone. Um, it would be a very critical uh, yeah. enabler of all the other and all the other um, options, uh, but it won't be the only option. Okay, so yeah, different players on the ground helping achieve the overall aim of uh, internet penetration across uh, the continent. Uh, that sounds sounds uh, good to me. Um, so. Dear Love Mary, how is media consumption evolving with the rollout of uh, fiber to the house use, FTTH? Because that's definitely very critical, um, especially for uh, you know how media is being used, talking about digital age that we're in and how things are fast changing, isn't it? Well, yeah, I can I can I can answer it in two ways. You know, we're looking at at the COVID pandemic and and, and the impact of that on South Africa, you know, people moving from business to to working from home. You know, we saw a huge, huge increase in data, like phenomenal increase in data. You, you're seeing the average household now over 400 gigs per month, you know, using in, across the network. That is in underserved areas and, and metros. So, so we're seeing there's just this huge, uh, we actually thought that after COVID, it'll, it'll, after the pandemic, it will start dipping down again, but we, we're not seeing that. We're just seeing this trend increasing slowly, year on year, uh, uh, increasing dramatically, and and I think that's because of of what what people are doing from the homes, you know. So 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 what we've got on the information that we have is, is obviously people are working from home, but you're seeing more and more people studying from home because the cost to travel into metros and the cost to travel around to do things is obviously uh, eating up that disposable income. So so you're seeing more and more people working from home, doing their businesses from home, starting their own business and studying. Uh, what we're then also seeing is your streaming services, your gaming services are absolutely jumping up like crazy. So, so there I'm saying is if you look at latencies and you look at speeds, there's more pressures on the speeds and there's definitely more pressures on the consumption. So, so and I agree with you, fiber can never take over over the full connectivity sphere of, of the world, but that convergence is critical between the mobile and the fixed play. If you look at if you look at the whole Europe and you look at the more developed world, that's what's happening. You know, because because at the end of the day, it's going to be about data in abundance. People, it's like a utility. You open a tap and the water has to flow, not drip out. And and that's the challenge. It's it's, it's and you can pull it back to a customer experience, or you can pull it back to just an experience. But, but we're really seeing, if you ask me from a media point of view, really increasing people working from home, um, call centers now, people are sending their call center staff out there, actually doing the call centers from home, not coming into call center, shift workers working from home in, in their own, in their own uh, 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 environments. And, and that's what we're seeing. And, and I think that's what you're seeing on the consumption side as well. You know, 400 gig per household, you know, a, a few five, a few years ago, I mean, it was... 10, 15, you know, and suddenly there's eight, nine devices live in that house. And that will that will create an opportunity for all the over the tops, the media people, the social, the, the, the Netflixes of the world, you know, the, the gaming platforms of the world to actually interact. And what makes me, what excites me more is, is how the entrepreneurial element of African develop 
from this. I think this this we haven't touched. Honestly, I, I think the young bright kids sitting at home with bright ideas actually create their own their own little businesses, and I would love to see that. You know, that's that's where I think it will go. Mm. I mean, Scott, I see you nodding your head uh, in approval to almost everything you say. That clearly seems like uh, your experience too, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I, I cannot agree with uh, with what the love said more. Uh, I mean, we're seeing a massive increase in in data demands around the the, the the volumes of data that are being consumed. You know, the the way media consumed is is different, and 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 the number of devices in the networks uh, or the the lands, if you like, are are, are huge. But you know, if you look now, at, uh, you know, I guess. Um, if we generationalize this a little bit, uh, which I, I, I don't want to do, you know, you, the, the, I'm going to say my generation have, have switched from, you know, um, live TV or, or linear TV much more towards on-demand services. So your 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 online streaming services, you know, will download a movie and, and that movie is now in 4K and, and they're talking about 8K, which is, you know, file sizes, you know, four, six, eight times the size that, that they were. And, and we expect those to play in real time from our, our streaming services. But, you know, the, the, the gaming, you know, from, from you know, I'm going to use my, my son as a reference, you know, the way he consumes media is completely different. You know, he's on, on TikTok um, and YouTube and, and he's gaming, but the gaming is fully interactive. He, he has a WhatsApp call open with 10 of his friends and he's playing Minecraft, which is a, an online streaming game. And, all of that is running over internet services, you know, the, the WhatsApp call, the, the, the live gaming while we're streaming in media. And, and that's really, you know, where, where the, the, the data consumption is coming from. But I think that the, the thing I agree with the Alof most about is the entrepreneurial side of Africa. I mean, it is, I, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm an Englishman and, but I've spent most of the last 15 years in Africa. And, and let me tell you the, the, uh, the level of ingeniosity and, and uh, entrepreneurial spirit to, to make things happen in Africa is is mind blowing, um, mm. and I, I I think we haven't even start to see the the, the true potential of, of what's going to come out of Africa in the next next ten years, and and connectivity is is critical to enable that to happen. But it's um, it, it's really exciting. Mm, I tell you what, I'm definitely excited for the opportunities. We talked about, uh, you know, platforms like TikTok and, uh, you know, other social media platforms. I have to say I'm quite terrible at that. Uh, my I should do better with my following and really investing more in that. But um, one key thing I take from all of this is the entrepreneurial side. Uh, especially looking at the continent. It's a very youthful continent. It's the most youthful continent, Africa. So, the, of course, there's immense opportunities. This takes us to the issue of uh, coming to you, Onyinye, when we talk about content uh, providers. They just sort of blew out, blossomed, especially, again, during the COVID pandemic. And, I mean, with, with internet usage really going up and the demand for it going up like that, what is that new opportunity for content providers now? I mean, I think there's there's um, there's a lot of opportunity for for content providers. Um, pr let's just say that prior to the whole uh, pandemic and all of that, they had to try to um, get their existence to be known, get their products or their solutions or the contents that they were um, developing to you know trying to get a market for it. Um, I think what the, pre uh, the the pandemic did was to flip that. Um, so now there is an increased requirement for content, um, not just uh, entertainment content, but content across, you know, education content, um, you know, um, learning, all sorts of tips and all of that. So you even have a lot of people who started businesses, um, you know, that were totally virtual and they still are running it and they've actually become very successful. So something you said, which is the fact that we are a very youthful continent. Um, and, and, and it, it also um, you know, affects the way we think, the way we consume information and all of that. So I don't see a situation where there's going to be any challenge. I actually think that um, this is a time for content providers and um, um, developers to actually blossom because the foundation is there. And um, from a telco perspective, we are very much aware um, that there's a need to continuously provide for content to our, our different uh, markets. And so we're looking for those um, content providers 
who are ready to come forward and work with us. Um, this is the age of bundling. This is a time where you, you, you provide solutions, um, not only as, as an operator, but by working with other partners to, to find um, use cases that you're able to fulfill. Um, and when we talk about the fixed uh, mobile convergence, it's not just about having the fixed mobile convergence. It's about having the ability to provide wholesome solutions that speak to different use cases um, in one bundle to the end user. And this presents an opportunity for the content providers. So what do they have to do? They just have to make themselves available because there will definitely be different types of um, options that are available. And this just takes me to how, you know, one of the key things that we always talk about is affordability. So what this new era has presented is the ability to slice and dice, uh, you know, content in a way that it's easily consumed and affordable to a, a wider uh, market, market um, segment or target market. So, so it presents an opportunity for them. And I, I only see it getting better. Mm. And I only see telcos being able to work even more effectively with content providers to slice and dice their content and provide this effectively to customers. Okay, thank you very much, Onyinye. We have a question uh, from the audience. We're gonna to get to that in a bit, but be be before that, uh, Dead Love Mary, we're talking about uh, a collaborative effort be between internet service providers and content providers. That is very key moving forward, especially when we're looking at the entrepreneurial side of things, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's very key. And I think one of our successes here as well, like I don't know the other markets, but but we open access. So so we tie up with all the ISPs in South Africa. So if you want to tie up with us with any proposition product, we allow you to tie in with us. There's, there's one or two little criteria, but but we base the success on open access. So we allow any any ISP to actually deal with us. So so what you're seeing is you're getting the young, you know, innovative ISPs coming in, and then you've got your structured ISPs staying on. And and I think that's that's a that's a critical thing, you know. It immediately, it, it drives competition on the one side, and it and it just it just it just creates an entry point where people can start picking best services, what they want, and it just opens up that whole sphere of of service and platforms out there, you know. So I think that's that's definitely critical, you know. I think that's one of our success factors on top of access to capital, and and I think what COVID also showed us is is that we have to open up things for for you know we were we were. Uh, asymmetrical, you know, up and download speeds, and 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 suddenly we had to go total symmetrical because people want the same speed down as up because because of exactly what we're doing at this point. You know, you you streaming Zoom came in, the Teams came in, and and all these the, these businesses came in, and and immediately we had to really really look at how we how we balance the traffic on the networks. You know, so so I think asymmetrical days are gone. You know, so so it's it's creating a symmetrical uh, uh, a service. Where people can then game. I mean, the latencies on it is, is brilliant. I mean, and I think that's at the end of the day what people want. You know, so it's 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 ongoing enhancement of 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 of, of what we can give, supporting the channels, which is the ISPs, the over the tops, and I believe partnerships is key. You know, and I I honestly see that the over the top players are also coming now to the party where they wanted to play a little bit differently. Now now they're coming and they are are partnering or talking at least to us. Because firstly, it's footprint and it's it's scale and it's it's penetration, mm. but now it's these services on top. And I just I, I just think through partnerships, willingness to work with us, uh, you know, integrating the APIs and the platform, so so you make it seamless from a maybe a billing on billing point of view, gives that one customer experience. And and, and honestly, that's that's how I see it. And and I agree with with uh, the previous speaker that that I think partnerships are absolutely critical, you know, and, and because we've got this asset, we've got the capital deployed, we've got mm -hmm. the services and, and we need this, you know, the, 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 the infrastructure, we need the services on top. But, okay. but also if you look at Africa, just sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think what you're seeing with, with MTN and Vodacom and, and, and Africa now, for the first time now, access to 5G is really becoming coming relevant, you know, so spectrums are available. And that's changing the whole game, remember, because suddenly this, this services, service platforms, quality of services is, is, is jumping into the whole MTN base and into the Vodacom basis of Africa. You know? And that opens a huge amount of opportunities then for, for, for us and for, for the ISPs on top of us. And I think that's very exciting, I must say, Eddie. 
Very, very well noted. I'm going to uh, take you guys on that offer uh, regarding partnerships. We're going to develop some content and hit you guys up for some good partnership. Let's see how that goes. Um, let's let's quickly get to this question. Um, uh, this uh, It's something that was mentioned earlier, and I'm going to come to you, Scott, with this one. This is a brief answer. Uh, we talked about a rural-urban divide, and someone is basically asking, how has the rural-urban divide evolved in Africa? And um, basically trying to find out what the plans are to really bridge that gap, how realistically that gap can be bridged. Scott. So I think uh, what, what we've seen over the last two years is, is that gap has narrowed. Um, I think where we, we saw um, everybody having to work from, from home from a, a COVID perspective and, and you know, that really forced the, the service providers and, and us as well um, to sort of get a little bit further out of the metro and a bit more into the, the, the rural areas. Um, so, so the gap has, has definitely narrowed, but, but the demand is, is still very high and, and there's still a lot of work to do there. Um, you know, I think from, from the, the liquid standpoint and which all, all I can really comment on is, you know, we've, we've been deploying a lot of uh, alternative solutions into the, the rural markets. You know, we've seen huge jumps in the number of ESAT services that have, have been deployed and, and, and satellite still a, a, an immensely critical part of the, the connectivity solution for, for Africa and the world as a, as a whole. And that's evolving. Um, you know, we've we've obviously expanded LTE networks and we're doing fixed wireless services into to those regions as well. Um, you know, so there's, there's been an awful, awful lot of work that, that's been done there. Um, but there, there's still a lot more to do. But overall, I think that the, the, mm. the gap has narrowed. Um, okay. I think if I can just just comment on the the, the content side of things as well is mm. I, I agree with with what the outlaw was saying around the asymmetry of the the services. Um, you know that that that's definitely narrowed a lot um, in terms of it, it being sort of two to one, three to one at a, at a max now. But a, a lot of that content, or the reason for that, is because content is now becoming local or, or ultra local. So you've got a lot of you know, content makers uh, in in areas that are uh, having to upload that content to platforms. You know, and I, I mentioned a couple of them, but you know, YouTube and TikTok are, are main ones where where that content's all being made at a at a macro level. Um, you know, and, and Africa's hugely diverse from a, 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 a sort of cultural and and language standpoint, and and you know, people want to watch content in in their own native language. I mean, South Africa is, for example, has got eleven. Uh, you know, defined national languages in uh, you know just one country, and everybody mm. wants to watch that. So that content generation and and being able to access that content is is a huge opportunity for the content makers or the, or the content providers to be onboarding that to their platforms to allow you know local filmmakers, local content makers, documentary makers, you know even even local sports, uh, mm. you know, and access to to to. I don't want to use televised because it's it, it's not television as such, but but events to be to be live streamed or or whatever that that was never there before, and and that's all coming about because of the the connectivity that, that that's being implemented across the continent. Okay, now uh, somehow just as we are trying to wrap up, questions are coming through, but uh, I, I think we've more or less answered some of the questions. People want to know about the government, uh, what, what governments can do to better complement the work you're doing. I think that was uh, touched on a bit earlier by Onyinye. Uh, a collaborative effort is very key in, in, in you know, rolling out you know, the, the, the bright future when you talk about uh, internet uh, penetration. People really want to find out more about the policies. But we have just about six minutes to wrap up and I have three panel members. So what are we wrapping up with now? What we, we've talked about, the, the, the future of it, we, we've talked about the challenges, we've talked about uh, the, the different collaborative efforts that come into play here. Um, and what then would you say, given each of you a minute, what is the future you see for the market, especially with the market evolving? Let me start with you first, uh, Ditlo. I would, I would definitely see if I can, if I can look a little bit into the future. I think you will see convergence happening. You know, so you will see some consolidation happening, definitely from, from an F and O, M and O point of view, even smaller F and Os to F and Os, fixed, fixed network operators to fixed network operators. So I, I see that happening, because because you need scale, and I think I think if you look at it, your big M and Os like the MTNs and the uh, the Vodacoms, 
will play a big part in that. You know, the the, the Barclays and the Airtels. I, I think they'll play a big part in that. What we what we will see from an ISP point of view, I also think, and I can talk a little bit South Africa, as you will see some consolidation happening there. You know, because because what you're seeing is we're driving prices down, margins are getting smaller, and it's a more it, it gets to a more scale business. And then I think if penetration happens, I believe we'll get to the 50, 60 percent penetration in South Africa, and 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 that will open up a lot of other opportunities for us. You know, you might even see localized ISPs within areas coming up, and I think it answers one of those questions. Maybe is you will see smaller little entrepreneurial players just in pockets in areas. You know, which will localize it a little bit, and I agree with Scott 100%, which will localize that area in a way with different content, with different languages, and they'll play what's relevant in that in that area. So so I, I really see some segmentation in areas, but I see definitely big consolidations in time, following a little bit to Europe, although Africa is totally different than Europe, but I yeah. think it becomes a scale game. Okay, Scott, um, look into your crystal ball right now. One minute. How do you see the market evolving in the coming years? I, I, I think it will continue to just, just grow hugely. I think that, as Dielo says, I think there'll definitely be some consolidation and, and some convergence. Um, I think we'll see the emergence of, of more uh, regional ISPs that will be able to access, you know, um, maybe an open RAN technology that, that, that comes in or, you know, access to the, the infrastructure in terms of, of providing a, a very... Um, localized uh, service provision in there. Um, I think that we'll continue to see, you know, the the long line big backhaul fibers being deployed. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot more subsea capacity coming online in in the next two years as well. That they'll, they'll bring prices down in the market. But you know, overall, I think you know the the, the penetration rates will continue to to go up as the price points continue to come down. Um, the technology is evolving at an immensely fast rate, um, and, and that's having a, a huge impact as well. So, um, so yeah, I think that'll that'll be the, the key things, and uh, and I hope as a result of that, we see some uh, some nice clear um, communication with the regulators around uh, making making that easier for the populations to access, and and, and more. Uh, more investment into to connectivity okay. and and training into schools so that the the penetration rates start at a much younger age uh, mm. and the understanding of the internet and what it can bring is 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 something that that young children from sort of four or five upwards are, are brought up with and understand the the benefits that that can bring them. Okay, Onyanya, you have the final words. It seems uh, the future is bright. Yeah, the future is very bright. Um, I see a future where there's going to be, um, you know, more focus on combining technologies uh, to deliver value. Um, I see this continuing. I see a, a future that would provide for um, strong partnerships where all the different different players within the digital ecosystem would um, would see an expression and be able to, you know, find value. Uh, and then in doing that. Uh, help to balance um, the cost impact um, to 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 the telcos, especially. I also see a situation where um, broadband is is going to be not just a supporter to the whole um, digital economy story, but a critical lever um, that would be required um, to to drive for the digital economy. Um, and I see Africa actually playing a very um, significant role in 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 driving that. Uh, because, I mean, as we all agree, we're a very youthful continent and uh, most economies are driven by the entrepreneurial efforts. So I see a situation where um, our, our push helps to actually position the continent uh, in terms of our economic growth. OK, definitely a big cheers to that. Uh, it's been it's been great hearing all of this. Uh, if you just joined us or if you've been following, we've been talking about uh, fiber deployment, a new opportunity for ISPs and content providers. And, and it definitely seems that the market is huge and there's, there's so much more potential out there. Uh, it's just a surface, it seems, that has been scratched and there's much more to delve into. So that that, that definitely makes me optimistic. Uh, thank you very much to our panel. We've had uh, Dietlov Mare, uh, CEO 
uh, Vumatel, South Africa, thank you very much for your time. Also, Onyinye Ikene Mecca, General Manager, Fixed Broadband, MTN Nigeria, not forgetting Scott Mumford, CEO, Liquid Telecom Satellite. Thank you very much, guys, for your inputs, your insights, and all that you've shared. I have learned a lot. I put down some points here, and I hope all of you watching and listening there too. I am Eddie Micah Jr. Uh, with uh, uh, Deutsche Villa. Thanks a lot for your time.